Discord. Welcome, everybody. This is our fourth program with Steve Morrison, who is our very first Zoom conversation guest on March 26th of last year. Ah, since we last spoke with Steve on September 29th, the U.S. passed half a million deaths from COVID-19 yesterday. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about. Today's program is brought to you by the UPS Foundation and by you, the members of the World Affairs Council. I wanna welcome the Consul General of Switzerland, Peter Zimmerle. Um, for all of you in the audience, we're gonna to move to questions at about 1225. Please use the question function in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please make your questions short and make them questions rather than opinions, that would be nice. Uh, Stephen Morrison is Senior Vice President at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, CSIS. He is the Director of its Global Health Policy Center. Steve is our partner in our annual Global Health Conference. He has a PhD in Political Science from the University of Wisconsin, his BA from Yale. Today's program is COVID-19 Part 4, Vaccine Rollout and Worrisome Variants. So Steve, look, I mean, I think first of all, we, we, we need to mark 500,000 deaths, more than the deaths the US suffered in World Wars I, World War II, the Vietnam War combined. So, I mean, that's, that's a, an, an extraordinary number. And I think it's on percentage terms, the highest death rate of any, certainly of any major country in the world. It is the highest, and uh, and it's a, an extraordinary number. Just as a just as a backdrop, I mean, last spring, as this was taking off, there was a lot of writing about what's the first year going to look like, and we're at the one year mark, right? And uh, a little past it, and uh, we put out Anna McCaffrey and I put out a. Uh, a, a paper on April 1st of last year with three scenarios that we laid out. And the middle scenario and the middle of the middle scenario was that we would have half a million people dead by this point in time. Um, and at that time, the, um, we were alarmists, you know, we were cast mm -hmm. as uh, oh, you're just another public health person who likes to ring our bell and get us all excited um, about this. And, uh, but we had a long explanation in the scenario on how we got to that point. And it was, it was the middle option. It was not a high performance and it wasn't the complete catastrophe. So uh, we could have been much, much worse, I guess is one of the points, but this is a colossal failure. It's a symbol of colossal failure at the national leadership level, at the level of public health capacity, um, at the level of political culture and political mobilization. And um, it comes at a moment when the case count in the United States stands at just over 28 million cases. Um, and I do think that President Biden, Vice President Harris, their spouses deserve a special commendation for what they've done. I mean the. The memorial last night was beautiful. It was moving. Um, uh, it was done in just a very dignified and dramatic way. They did something very similar, very beautiful and very moving on the night before the inauguration on January 19th at the reflecting pool, the Lincoln Memorial at dusk. Uh, the, and and this, this signals something. It signals that the president and the vice president are determined to not allow us to forget, because there is a strong impulse to forget. In the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, we lost 670,000 Americans and America was a third the size it is today. Mm -hmm. There is one memorial in the entire country to those 670,000 people who died. People wanted, people were hurt, hurtful. They were, uh, they were hurting badly. They were in pain. They were feeling a sense of shame. Uh, and regret, and they moved on. Uh, here we have uh, we have a conscious effort pushing against that, and also it's a effort to push for unifying our country, 
sh our common humanity, our shared loss. And it's an effort at trying to detoxify and depoliticize the language and behavior around this tragic pandemic. We're, we'll talk in a moment about the positive things that are happening and the trajectory that we're on. But I do think it is really quite remarkable the, what President Biden and Vice President Harris have done in this regard and extremely laudable. Over to you, Charles. Well, I mean, it can't give you any satisfaction to have been correct in your estimation on the number of tests. No, not at all. I just, yeah. I'm not bragging. Yeah. I'm, no, saying not. That, I'm saying that when we sat down and looked at the numbers and, and, and consulted with the experts and tried to amalgamate what we were hearing from four or five modelers and put it into a short paper, that's where we landed was, you know, uh, assimilating these other, these other modelers, it, the, the probability given the course we were on at that time and keep in mind in april things were optimistic in april yeah. we hadn't we hadn't turned we had a high national consensus in march and april and things were looking good it was it was only as we hit summer and into fall that things began to come really unhinged well let me to, on an on an up note i want to tell you that uh, yeah. about an hour ago i got my second vaccination and it's, it's funny, just by coincidence, a, a friend of mine, a seventh grade classmate of mine had hers at exactly the same time in Auburn, Alabama. Um, what can, I mean, does this mean that suddenly I can start going to clubs and restaurants and, um, you know, scheduling vacations? Well, that's a question that many, many, many Americans are, um, are asking themselves here today. Um, you know, we're in an optimistic moment right now, yep. right? Case The case counts on, uh, on COVID-19 have fallen more than 40% over the last two weeks, 70% since the peak in January. Uh, the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluations projecting that the daily case count will drop to 30,000 by June 1st. Oh. 78% decline from the current March 1st estimate is 137,000 a day. You know, you remember that uh, Tony Fauci in the fall said, we need to get the baseline in this country down to 10,000 to have control. So if you, IHME is saying we're gonna be going from 137 to, to, to 30,000 by June 1, that's, that's remarkable. So we, what we're seeing is the, what you're experiencing, I got a second vaccine uh, recently. We're seeing the, mic, the movement in bulk of vaccination in America. Uh, 44, as of yesterday, 44 million Americans had received their first dose. That's 13% of the US population. 19 million of which you and I are part of received their second dose, 6% of the US population. So we're marching towards some sort of moment in, in the next few months when we will get to a much higher level. Um, we're projected to have 50% of our country uh, vaccinated by July 19th. Uh, we'll have 600 million doses available by the end of July. Uh, so the supply constraints are gonna be right. overcome. Uh, we have very high quality vaccines. We're blessed with the Pfizer Moderna vaccines. j and is coming on seasonality is gonna kick in. Uh, and we have some portion of our, of our population, 25 or 30% who have immunity of some form from the infection itself. But back mm -hmm. to your question, Charles, I think we get a certain, I, most of America that's experiencing what you and I have experienced are heaving a huge sigh of relief. No kidding. Like, okay, I've got, I've got now 95% of infection against life-threatening extreme disease. That's, that means my odds have dropped to one in 20 from you know pretty high odds. And okay, what does that all mean? Well, it, it means we have to continue to be very cautious in our behavior and not see this as a get out of jail free card. A lot of people may see it as a get out of jail free card. And many people are worried that folks who get their second vaccine vaccine are gonna jump on planes, go play golf, take vacations, 
stop wearing masks and, and stop social distancing and stop staying away from congregate settings. Why is that so dangerous? You and I are protected against extreme illness, but we are not, we, we do not know, we are not protected against infecting other people. So you can get sick, you can get infected, but be asymptomatic or have only mild disease, but be passing that disease on to other unprotected people. So we're still weapons. We're still potentially weapons. We do not know how long this immunity is going to last, right? That's another unknown. So yes, we've acquired this immunity, but what if it fades in six months? And the third thing I'd say is the arrival of variants. Variants, of course, are proliferating. They're mutations. They are appearing in large populations where there's uncontrolled community transmission, where you just have massive replication. It's throwing forward these variants. We've got the UK variant, the South Africa, the Brazilian. There are many, many, many variants out there that we don't, we have not been able to even detect because we don't have pervasive genomic sequencing capacity. But what we're seeing is that these variants to varying degrees are able to escape the vaccine, are able to reinfect people who, are, who, were, who were infected and acquired an immunity earlier. We're seeing that phenomenon. We're seeing them disrupt therapies. Monoclonal antibody therapies were the most promising therapies for uh, uh, avoiding severe, severe illness. You give them early on to people who are infected and you avoid the progression to serious illness. We're trying to bring down uh, intubation, ICU and death in hospitals in managing this, this disease and these tools, the vaccines, monoclonal antibodies are key in relieving the burden on our health system and making this a more manageable disease where people are not being put in extreme conditions and dying and having deep lasting, if they survive, deep lasting. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, which is until, until some later point when the majority of Americans, and what is that, 80 or 85% have been vaccinated safely, and until the virus viral load in our society has been brought way, 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 way down, we're still going to have to be very cautious. We're going to still have to use masks and be very cautious. And the variants are turning the idea that we're gonna hit a hard pivot towards herd immunity on its head. The variants are saying to us, this is gonna be a constantly evolving recurrent pandemic that is not going to be driven into the corner. And we're gonna to have to live with this and manage it like seasonal flu, only it's 10 times as dangerous as seasonal flu. And we don't know yet what that fully means. It, it, or, I mean, I, my, my question was going to be, what should we be cautious about? And you've already answered it. But um, is this kind of mutation and the appearance of variants unusual? I mean, is it quicker than with the, the seasonal flu? Uh, or is this just I'm, I and so many other people are ignorant about the way pandemics work and about mutations and viruses. I think that um, uh, if you listen to the coronavirus experts, they would say to you with this level of uncontrolled transmission in such large populations around the world is inevitable you're going to get lots and lots and lots of of, of, uh, of, of variants. You're gonna get mutations and variants. That's how the virus copes with this. And it is able to thrive when it gets into a population of uh, infected people who have compromised immune systems. That's, that's like a very, very favorable environment. And, and um, I think there's been, we've seen some reflection coming from scientists also in this country saying we made a big mistake in the spring when we said we don't need to worry enough about that. And we have made a big mistake in not saying, wait a second, not only do we need testing across this country, and we made a huge error on that side, but we need genomic sequencing in order to know when, when these, when these uh, variants are in our midst and what are they. And we have woefully in, uh, inferior 
capacity in that regard. And we're racing right now, CDC in the lead, racing to get that capacity up and running in the country. So we're playing catch up on a problem that is way out in front of us. The British variant is thought to, is, thought, is believed that it will become dominant in the United States by the end of March. Well, we're almost at March. So this is right around the corner that we're gonna see this. And we know that the variant accelerates transmissibility by at least 50%. We know that there's a, a suspicion that it has mortality implications, that more people die. And, and the other things that I talked about, about escaping therapies um, and, and escaping vaccines. So it's, it's a new world we're in. I don't think we should panic. Uh, I, back to your question, I think some of the scientists who worked this anticipated we would see this and have said, what did you, what, what did you expect? But we've been in crisis mode and we're kind of moving from step to step, but this is the new world we're in. There's going to be massive expansion in genomic sequencing under the $1.9 trillion bill that Congress is looking at. There's 1.75 billion for genomic sequencing. CDC has just released 200 million right now as an interim step. Keep in mind, let me just back up for a moment. Last week I was talking to Tom Frieden, former head of CDC there in Atlanta for seven, eight years of the Obama administration. He was saying in his tenure, he had to battle and go through over a hundred meetings in order to win concurrence from OMB and Congress and others to put $30 million a year into genomic sequencing. Right. And it was just seen as not significant or important enough. And now, it, uh, now obviously in this context, it's hugely important. The, I mean, we're all accustomed to the idea that the flu vaccine every year has to be different than, than from the previous year. How, how agile are Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson? I mean, can you, do they have to wait a year to make a change or can you make a change in the, in the, the, the formula for lack of a better word um, every few months as variants arise? I mean, how, how does that work? Can you talk us through that a little bit? Well, sure, I can offer a few thoughts, um, but with the caveat that a lot of this is in process and not truly known at this moment in time. Now, the messenger RNA vaccines, which Pfizer, Moderna are both messenger RNA, in which a, uh, a, a genetic material, RNA genetic material is, 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 is put into the, into the cell. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it, when there's a variant, uh, you can modify the genetic code uh, for that. And that is a, any, that particular vaccine platform is, is very easily tweaked uh, scientifically. Um, and that is a, a potentially a huge, a huge advantage. Um, and so both Pfizer and, uh, and Moderna are looking at, at boosters as a third, you may need to go, you and I may need to go get a booster in some period of time still to be defined. Um, they're, they're looking at, 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 at a wholesale revamp. Well, then you get into the question, how many variants are you gonna revamp to? Because they're, in three or four weeks time, we're gonna we will have discovered more. And, and then you have to get into the discussion of which ones are, mo which ones are most yeah. important. Because there's variants out there. If we start looking for them, we'll find them. And then the question is, which ones are really important? We know the, the South Africa, the UK, the, the, the one and soon two Brazilian uh, variants are dangerous and, and, and move, move fast. Um, so what we may be looking at, Charles, eventually is multivalent uh, vaccines. Seasonal flu, when you get a seasonal flu shot, it mixes in typically three a, 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 a vaccine against three different variants. And so it's a multivalent vaccine. Um, and they're just taking their best guess at what the flu is gonna look like. They have to make that determination nine or 12 months before. And the efficacy suffers oftentimes. Some, some years, the yeah. efficacy is 30, 40%. And Americans, Americans have a, you know, they don't, 
the majority of Americans do not take their flu vaccine. Right. Uh, but what we are potentially looking at here is the need to get a recurrent annual recurrent vaccine that could be multivalent in order to protect ourselves and not and and that may turn out to be not an optional thing it may be something that's really essential um and that may beg questions around you know uh institutions making this mandatory versus voluntary when we talk about tweaking a vaccine i mean it makes it sound like easy right you know like yeah i'll just turn it up turn it down a little bit do, do the pharmaceutical companies have to go through the same extensive clinical trials every time? Not yet. Five, no. They... No, what, what, what FDA has ruled uh, is that uh, the, uh, the modification uh, to the uh, genetic uh, definition for the Pfizer and Moderna, um, uh, that the, the trials are much smaller and faster. Uh, three or 400 people, Oh, that's all. Uh, and okay. and and that's been per, that there's permission for that. And and that has to do with scientific uh, basis. It has to do with obviously the urgency and need for speed here. Um, but my answer to your question is that model of vaccine lends itself to quick modification. Some of the other vaccines are less uh, of that way and are going to take longer time to make adjustments and are going to require potentially longer field trials. But all of this is, is, is in debate at the moment. Uh, but it plays, the proliferation of variants plays to the advantage of Pfizer and Moderna as against the other types of vaccines that we have out there. So, I, I, maybe just me, but every morning when I go on to the New York Times website, I look to see which states are doing the best and which states are doing the worst in vaccinating their populations. And both the best and the worst, some are have Republican governors, some have Democratic governors. Um, what, and it seems like Alaska, West Virginia, New Mexico are always at the top. Um, and unfortunately, Georgia is near the bottom. Um, what do, what have we learned so far? What are the best practices about mass vaccinations or giving the COVID vaccination in a, in a mass, massive form? Well, we, we learned a couple of really hard lessons really early on, right? I mean, the Operation Warp Speed put its focus on accelerating the development of the vaccines and had remarkable success. And it was a big scientific breakthrough that we arrived with two now three great vaccines uh, in record speed, et cetera, et cetera. It's planning for the vaccination campaign uh, had supplies only going out to 64 jurisdictions as a drop point. And then it was the responsibility of states and cities and counties to sort of make their way forward. And, and that's where things got really bad because there just was not a coherent plan and there was not a data system tracking supplies and there was no uniformity and standardization in terms of data and in terms of the, the priority categories and allocations. And so you had quite a bit of chaos. You had a lot of vaccine in the early phases uh, being held back in unknown right. locations. You had overestimation of how many people in nursing homes there were who needed to be served. And then there was the complication of should we hold back a second dose or first dose? So you had very low distribution, very low distribution percentages, and you had an American public in these various places getting really annoyed and upset and frustrated. Um, and so the failures came from multiple directions, as we've seen. Right? There were this was hugely complicated logistically, and um, and hu hugely complicated in terms of the prioritization schemes and the like. Uh, and, and, and the pressures were enormous and the supply has been far less than demand up to now. Right. So that problem has been uh, bearing on everybody. Uh, and so what have been the better performers? I think the better performers have, be, have been states, if you're talking about states versus county level. I mean, right. at state level, they have been uh, uh, places that have shown enlightened leadership 
and uh, a seizure of initiative by the governors in partnership with the county county folks and the other the other the pharmacies that are doing distribution and now you have mass sites being created by FEMA with national guards the outlets are multiplying and um, and the but the supply remains constrained and that's had a further uh, confusing impact we're seeing this in all across Maryland right now you're having you know Sor uh, sources of doses diverted out of county allocations towards the mass vaccine sites mm. um, because the supply is constrained, but you're, you're, there's enormous pressure to get more and more sites and more delivery met me uh, methods and vehicles up and running uh, with the expectation that the supply will, will improve as we head into March and it'll begin to e e e even out. So the places that have done well are ones that had very strong and enlightened leadership who saw this problem and were very pragmatic and streamlined the prioritization and communicated it to people and, and got into the communities at local levels in explaining what was going on and gave clear and honest projections around what could be expected. The chaos and confusion came when people couldn't live up to their commitments, when they made projections that were that they couldn't deliver and then they had to walk those back and then the trust and confidence fell. And then how do you rebuild that trust and confidence with an angry public that that's decided that you really don't know what you're talking about. So the leadership that was very careful in how they moved ahead, who streamlined things so that it was not excessively complicated in the prioritization and the delivery systems and were clear in their clear and honest in their communications, and and had a rootedness in the neighborhood pharmacy, or the local community leadership, or the local faith leadership, whoever it was, so that they were getting people to understand what the process was, and having a process of registration that was intelligible, not confusing and debilitating and humiliating which is what so many people have experienced. Yes. Um, as <laughs> you've probably experienced. I mean, it's exactly. just- Exactly. It, 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 it's exasperating because it doesn't have to be that way. Right. And what we're seeing in Maryland is a free for all. You know, it's like people finally just go, okay, well go try five or six different outlets and good luck, it's on you. That's not the answer people want. The ant people want okay, there's a, there's a process here. It's, you're going to be treated fairly. It's coherent. You may have to wait, but you know what you're waiting for. And you, and you can begin to, to, to do this rather than dropping everything and being stuck in this endless churning. I mean, just about opening schools. I mean, there's, there's been, that seems to be the news the last couple of days. California set aside doses for teachers. Um, and as the supply increases, I mean, the idea is that you can um, vaccinate teachers without delaying, you know, your and my vaccinations because the supply will increase. Is does that make sense? Is that is, is that the right way to go? So we can get schools open and get kids back learning again. The the schools issue is seems to me to be one of the most complicated and difficult. Um, challenges right now in the country and you just reading the the new guidance from CDC and the debates uh, that has, have been engendered um, and listening to the teachers themselves and parents and authorities mayors and and school you know school authorities educators um, and the like the getting the teachers to feel confident in their safety um, is an essential step. I think what we're hearing is from the Biden administration and from others is let's do the very best we can to get those vaccines out there, but let's also move simultaneously forward in those many other essential steps that are going to create safety in a classroom. So let's get the ventilation correct. Let's get the spacing correct. Let's work out arrangements that may be hybrid arrangements so that we are not overcrowding or we're not overtaxing. And let's make sure that we have the ability to, to do testing. Uh, and and a lot of, a lot of the, the big money required 
in order to upgrade ventilation is contained in that $1.9 trillion yeah. bill, right? The, the, that bill contains a lot of money for schools to, to turn the corner infrastructurally in order to create an environment. So getting vaccines into teachers are, is a terribly important goal. And I think people are recognizing that. And, and, and our system is decentralized enough that it's the, it's the choice at the state level and oftentimes in the municipal uh, level to choose on prioritization and make some trade-offs. Obviously, in the first phase, we were looking at healthcare workers. We were looking at the elderly. We were looking at those that are the most vulnerable uh, in terms of uh, underlying conditions and the like. The data on teacher vulnerability shows there's vulnerability, but not, oftentimes is not as acute as the vulnerability of other essential workers or of right. other populations. So there's been a difficult balancing act as if you're trying to say, where are you in the queue? Where are you in the prioritization ladder? And, and, and based on what data? Uh, and that's, an, that's been a painful conversation because you don't want to deny the, the fear and the risk that people feel in wanting to go do their jobs. And I, and I have, my family is full of educators uh, and, 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 and I talk to them all the time about this issue. My, my older sister is a member of a school board and she spends all of her time on these issues. And I can't begin to understand all of the complexities involved. Well, the, in the, fear, the fear is real, even if the data doesn't support the fear. Right. And so, you know, if the teachers are afraid to go back in the classroom, you've got to, you've got to deal you with got that. A problem. You got you a got, problem. You got, you got a real problem. Let me encourage everybody, please uh, use the Q&A function to send me questions. If the bottom of your screen, it says more. Click on more and one of those things that pops up is questions and use that and send me some questions. Um, Steve, I saw that in Israel, people are getting, I don't know what the document is, but it's the document that proves that you've had both doses of the vaccine and that you can't, that there's gyms and restaurants you can't get, you're not allowed to enter unless you have this health passport. Right. Is, is that a good way to go? Is that something we should copy in this country? Could we even do that in this country? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion going on about what would a vaccine pa passport be? How would it be administered? Um, and uh, as we've said, you know, uh, having a vaccine doesn't make you necessarily uh, uh, continuously free of threat to yourself or to somebody else. And there is, there's a lot of ethical issues. This, this issue has been debated out uh, over the last year. And, and I, I think it's fair to say the early discussions were more hypothetical and there was a lot of debate among the ethicists about what does it mean when you begin to divide your population into those that have been vaccinated versus others? And is, are we heading into some sort of um, surreal kind of set of divisions? Because not everybody's going to want the vaccine and they may have perfectly legitimate reasons for not doing that or have access to it because of disparities and, and historical experiences that make them reluctant or perfectly legitimate concerns that lead them to want to wait and clarify their legitimate concerns before choosing to take a vaccine. So if you put pressure on people in that way, there are very real ethical considerations that come forward. Now, once you had uh, safe and effective and marvelous vaccines, and then you had the introduction of vaccines uh, here and in Israel and many other places, suddenly the debate becomes quite real, right? I mean, it yeah. becomes a very real thing um, and around restaurants and around uh, any congregate setting, around travel, around returning to work um, and the like. And Israel's amazing in the sense that it has um, moved so fast to, pop, to, to vaccinate its population of 9 million people. I think they're approaching 50% and they're going yeah. to hit herd immunity in like at 80% level 
very rapidly. It's, so it's a remarkable achievement. There's also great scientific field trials going on. I mean, the Pfizer field trial, there was two groups, 8,000 each end of last week, was, which was revelatory. So there's lots of good science going on there as well. And, and they're pushing the margins and it's a small enough society and there seems to be a sufficient consensus. I, 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 I'm less familiar exactly how people in Israel feel about this, but, but, but I'm sure there are some objections, but there may be a consensus around the validity of this. In some other places where there's quite heavy regulation uh, of testing and, 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 and infection rates and the like, particularly in like South Korea, Taiwan, Elsewhere, there's been, in, there's been use of technology to record your status. Um, and, and we're gonna see more of that and the privacy concerns and ethical concerns are gonna get weighed out. I might add also, you know, the, the travel industry, particularly airlines yeah. are very exercised with this issue. And there's a consortium of the major international airlines that have put together a passport. And this is something that is on an app it records both when you were most recently tested, but also when you were vaccinated. And it has contact, contact data in there too. So that let's say you're exposed while you're on that plane and somebody needs somebody at CDC needs to track you down and make sure you're safe and not transmitting onto someone else. That sort of thing is, is in the air and being developed. At the end of the day, at an international level, it's the World Health Organization that owns the yellow card. Sure, that we all you know, had when we got, when we made our first trip abroad. Right. And under the international health regulations. And so if some norm, if some electronic digital version of a yellow card is developed and introduced and embraced, it'll again be under some kind of auspice of the World Health Organization. There could be lots of variations. Um, the here in the United States, um, we have, let's go back to the whole question of hesitancy and refusal. The data, the most recent data coming from Kaiser Family Foundation and others is showing today a, a promising uptick in the enthusiasm for taking on vaccines. It's now at about 47% of Americans are saying as either I just got vaccinated and I'm happy that's a, the small percentages that we talked about, or it's 41, 42% who are saying, I'm ready to go, I can't wait. As soon as I can get one, I'll embrace this. Okay, that's great. Cause that number is up from 39, 40% just a few weeks ago. And we're seeing this in UK and elsewhere that as vaccines are introduced, enthusiasm is going up in a significant way. Right. But we have in the United States, 13 to 14% who are hardcore refuseniks. And we've got today about 31% who are saying, I wanna wait, I'm a maybe, I want, I've got some issues. And they've got a number of issues that are very legitimate issues. And they wanna be clear in their own minds around what those risks are before they embrace. So um, I think we're a long way away from people moving towards uh, mandatory proof of vaccination before you get into a restaurant or into a uh, uh, an airline or you know the airlines have have are fighting this uh, they haven't the airlines have not insisted up to this point that their own staff be vaccinated um, they're not ready to do that because they feel they'll get a reaction they'll get lawsuits they'll have uh, they'll lose employees um, it'll divide their population. Um, it's a sensitive matter. And I think we're gonna have to proceed uh, in a very sensitive way. It's the, the, the other place I would point to is universities and colleges, right? Where the risks we've seen are huge. The innovations in testing have been led by universities and colleges. And they have, fig for, clear, clear, for clear reasons, right? They have to they face a huge challenge and they've got some expertise they can bring to that. And I think you're gonna see very interesting innovations around vaccinations and, and record keeping and comfort levels at colleges and universities and how they navigate that is gonna be quite interesting. Yeah. Susan Keeper asks, 
about a paper out of India with evidence that those fully vaccinated with both the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines cannot transmit the virus to others. Have you seen this? Is this, um, you know, as you have people all over the world doing research, how do you figure out what, what's the research that counts and what's the research that uh, requires further investigation? Well, there are some studies that are that are early studies that are uh, suggesting suggesting this, and let's be hopeful about that. Um, this one um, uh, Israeli uh, uh, study that I referenced um, around Pfizer showed one dose having uh, remarkable impact, yeah. and 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 that transmission onward transmission. Uh, 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 being prevented. So there's, there's, there, there's an accumulation, but we're not at the point yet where, uh, uh, where people are declaring that um, we can be fully confident in that. Um, there, you know, we, what we're hearing from the likes of Dr. Fauci is this, this debate is uh, this debate around prevention, the, whether these vaccines prevent transmission versus just blocking progression into severe disease and death um, until the end of the year. So uh, I, uh, I'm encouraged to hear this uh, and, and let's hope maybe that pace will be accelerated, um, but it, um, it's, a, uh, it, it's still one of those unknowns. I would also point out that one of the other big unknowns is of course children. Right. We have not had adequate field trials yet. There's been some, but there's not adequate field trials yet on children, um, and they and there's and 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 they are not likely to get vaccinated um, uh, until later in the year or into early next year, and that's another that's another thing to keep in mind. I mean, we need for, in order to approximate herd immunity setting aside the variant issue for a moment, we need at least to get to 65% coverage. And probably we need to get to 80 or 85 with the variants out there. And if we have 15% or 14% of our population that's not gonna buy in under any circumstance, and we got 31 that are on the fence, you see the challenge, right? We're gonna have to work hard in order to close the gap and, and convince people that it's in their best interest and that this is safe and effective and that all of their legitimate concerns have been answered. Well, a lot of the questions that are coming in are all about that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried, you know, I've taken the flu vaccine and I've gotten ill from that. How do I know this is really safe? Um, questions about when will other categories, additional categories open up for vaccination, which I believe is that that state, each state makes its yes. own decision. That's yes. not, right. I mean, it, because both health and education are controlled by the states, not by the federal government. Right, right. So, so the CDC can advise, but it's up to the state to decide what it's going to do. On the prioritization categories and yes. the sequencing of them. I mean, CDC and an advisory committee issued guidance out to the states uh, in the fall, and then they were at the end of the summer and into the early fall, and then they were to develop their plan, tailored to their own circumstances, and then review those. And some of the plans were were quite good, and some were not so good, and some got back and forth the discussion around this. But the states also have relaxed or or simplified. They've streamlined right. because they've come to this conclusion that simpler is more effective, and they've also um, uh, you know, rethought some of the risk categories. Um, and, and it's a balancing act. Uh, it's really a balancing act that introduces multiple factors. Um, Kathleen Geegan asks, and maybe you can, or we'll, we can get it to her later. Um, is there a website that she can go to to find out more about the, 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 the vaccines and you know, are they safe? Are they not safe? I mean, where can you just learn more about the, the immunology and, and would it be safe for her so she can make a decision? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, uh, CDC has, ha has, has, has a terrific website. 
Um, but all of the major uh, international um, uh, uh, press outlets, uh, if you go to the New York Times, uh, if you go to the Financial Times, uh, if you go to The Economist, um, if you go to The Washington Post, you will find dedicated websites on all of these matters that will answer all of your questions very, very quickly and very accurately. And, and I, I'm astonished at how much, inf much information presented quite well is available on these places. Um, they've really made a vast commitment uh, to, uh, to, to serve in that way. I would also recommend if you, uh, uh, that you look at um, STAT, S-T-A-T, which is a, uh, um, a, a Boston-based uh, uh, outlet on, dedicated on health matters. And they have lots of great work and it's free it's freely accessible. Um, so some of these are subscriptions, some are free. Uh, what I've seen in many of these outlets, I would put the Wall Street Journal among those also that have created uh, enormously impressive uh, uh, websites. They tend to take those that are the informational tracking um, websites and, um, and made those accessible. They're not behind pay bars. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, just very briefly about the pharmaceutical industry in India, which apparently is just cranking out, you know, has the ability to produce huge numbers of vaccines and, and appears to be doing that. Well, the Serum Institute of India um, is the biggest manufacturer of vaccines in the world. Um, and it uh, has formed partnerships with AstraZeneca, uh, the um, a British Swedish um, producer of, a, of the Oxford vaccine, um, and 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 it has positioned itself as a partner also with um, the what's called the Covax facility, which is a facility organized by WHO, by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, by CEPI to bring vaccines in an affordable, safe, effective way, timely way to low and middle income countries. So uh, the Indians are emerging as central to the global response in many respects. They have capacity to produce safe and effective vaccines. They, they can amp up that capacity. They are amping it up dramatically. Um, there's another uh, actor, Bharat, which has come forward with its own vaccine and is, and is also a major player. So the Indians are going to play in terms of both the commercial side uh, in partnership with, with the big developers like AstraZeneca. They're gonna play on the solidarity side of things in terms of trying, being, uh, being a, a partner uh, with the COVAX facility. They're also part of India's vaccine uh, diplomacy. In other words, you've got the Russians out there marketing Sputnik V, their vaccine. You have the Chinese out aggressively mar marketing several vaccines across the world in a very aggressive way. The Indians are, are players as well in terms of being very proud of this and using this as a, as a tool of international diplomacy. Okay. Um... I've got somebody, the Kathleen Geegan has come back. She said, can we recommend an immunologist she can talk to? Or I don't know, is there an institute of immunology that, that, that where she can go? She wants to go beyond apparently what the media is asking. And then I mean, my, my final question for you, I'm gonna ask you two quite different questions. Joe Biden's primary campaign, you know, vote for me is because I'm gonna sort this out and I'm gonna do it right. Um, and I assume by the summer that will be how the, this administration will be judged is how they do on uh, COVID-19. Do you have any advice for the administration? I mean, what, what would you like to see them do more of, less of, different focus? Um, what, what should they be doing they're not doing? Um, your first question, I think if you're looking for respected immunologists to to uh, make contact with, 
Obviously, uh, Emory University Atlanta is full of very respected immunologists. Um, CDC, of course, is full of them. Uh, every major American university. And, and when you read the press, you see them. Uh, it's interesting. You see these folks quoted all over the place constantly. Uh, there's a premium on finding uh, a, a really great immunologists. Uh, Angela Rasmussen at Georgetown, for instance. And I could rattle off these names, but they've become the intermediate voices, the voices of, of, of independence, of expertise, uh, who can try to make sense of the science and, and act as a, as a trusted messenger about this. Keep in mind, we are in a very polluted digital environment with lots of misinformation and disinformation flooding the gates and uh, fed from multiple directions, getting the voice of this is reliable science, this is what you can believe and trust in is exceedingly difficult in the current moment. Trust and confidence has fallen in the digital era going back to 1998. We've seen this surge of anti-vaccine right. sentiment into a very, lots of falsehoods and deliberate misinformation, disinformation, and that's something we struggle with. Um, and, 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 it's, and it complicates the lives of those people in, who are in the midst of uncertainty and crisis, people start searching for answers to their concerns when they ask, is this safe? Is it going, am, if I'm pregnant, am I at risk? If I have a uh, compromised immune system, am I at risk? All of these legitimate reasons, and they start looking for answers. Oftentimes they'll find answers that are not very good answers and, and, and can, can feed mistrust and feed wrong bad science. So it's, 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 a, it's a very important moment. It's very important for those trusted virologists to be out there talking. Lena Wen, who's not a virologist, but a public health official, former head of, of the health in, in the city of Baltimore, is a columnist in the Washington Post twice a week, and she's one of these translators. She makes sense of the science. Uh, and there are several other, Ashish Jha, the Dean of the School of Public Health in, um, in, in, at Brown University. On your question around Biden, and I know we're running out of time, uh, the Biden administration you know, has staked its future on its ability to, to, to deal with this pandemic. Um, it has no choice, it is its top priority. It's seen as essential to unlocking the reopening of our economy, of our schools, of our society. Um, uh, and, um, and, and when you look at what happened in the first opening days, it was FDR, it was a wartime mobilization. Uh, it was saying national leadership is going to uh, be established across seven core goals, equity being one of the biggest, that they were gonna sort out the supply chain chaos they were going to get the. They were going to use the Defense Production Act to amp up production. They've secured now, in the last couple of weeks, uh, guarantees of getting those 600 million doses from Pfizer, Moderna by the end of July. They're going to get 100 million from J and J. They're looking for greater rigor and accountability and metrics, um, and they've created the structure and they flooded the media marketplace with Tony Fauci and Rochelle Walensky, the dynamic charismatic new leader of CDC there in Atlanta. Uh, and they put out a national strategy. They put out the first presidential security directive, number one on this matter. They put out the first opening days, 13 executive orders and, and the like, and they have a great team. Now they're awaiting that $1.9 trillion package, which will include $400 billion that's gonna go into some form of the response here. Um, and the U.S. and they are re-engaging internationally, re-engaging, rejoining uh, WHO, joining this COVAX facility, committing four billion dollars to it over two years. The president participated in the Munich Security Conference and the G7 last Friday, and made this a top line priority and the like. All of these are very very important things in terms of advice. I think that the president, if you listen to the president and you listen to Tony Fauci in recent days, very he, they have been very cautionary uh, about the unknowns and the need not to overpromise. 
the need not to say, we're gonna be fully open by the end of this summer and the fall. They're now being very cautious and saying, look, there are, there are uncertainties here. We have to stick with this. We have to stick with this plan. Um, I think getting out to Kalamazoo to visit the Pfizer plant, getting out to Milwaukee to meet with, um, meet with citizens who are living with this, uh, getting out to Texas, getting out to other places is, is, is gonna be hugely important. And the more that can be done in that level of engagement outside of Washington, I know it's unsafe to, for the president to be moving around too much, but this is very impactful and very important, I think. On the international side, I wish we would do more, more quickly in talking about how we're going to use our massive surpluses to benefit low and middle income countries. I, don't, I think if we wait too long, we're going to be seen as wholly consumed with our own self-interest and the ground is gonna be yielded to the Russians and the Chinese. And, and we need to join forces with the Canadians and the Brits and the French and the EU and others and try and sort out this chaotic and untransparent marketplace and make damn sure that through COVAX and through direct contributions of surpluses that we can begin to make sure that there's a minimum gap between what the wealthy and wealthiest and most powerful countries achieve in getting their populations vaccinated versus what's gonna happen in low and middle income countries. If that gap is three or four years, it's gonna be horrible. Yeah. And we need to get that gap down to like six months and it's gonna take leadership from the US at the diplomatic front and strategic use of our surpluses. Steve Morrison, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate this and appreciate your sharing your views and your the knowledge you've gained uh, running the Global Health Policy Center at the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. This has been really, really useful and full of great information. Uh, for the audience, we've got two more programs this week. We've got one Thursday at 530 with a member of the Ghanaian Parliament. It's organized by our young leaders and it's going to discuss the African continental free trade area, meet the world's largest free trade area. That's at 5.30 p.m. on Thursday. Friday at noon, we have Dr. Maurice Hobson uh, from the History Department at Georgia State University. And the topic is the black middle class, a myth. It's gonna be fascinating. Please join us, please join the council. Please subscribe to our YouTube page so you can see this and our other programs. We'll put this program up this afternoon. And I want to thank the council staff, Fernanda Lukine Shihara, our executive director, Val Lopez de Frank, our producer of this program, and Laura Brower, our newest uh, member of our team, who is the associate producer. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you all Thursday at 5:30. Thanks again. Steve, thanks. This has been great. Thank you, Charles, and thanks to Fernanda and Val. It's always great to be with you. Well, it's, it's great having you with us. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon.